Soulsborn. You may have heard this term before. It's a term used to describe a set of action JRPG games made by From Software. The term Souls comes from the first game called Demon Souls, as well as the subsequent three Dark Souls games. The term Born comes from the game Bloodborne. For this video, I played through all official Soulsborne games to their completion and defeated all the bosses in order to review the entire franchise. In the first release of this video, many people were upset that I did not include Sekiro Shadows Die Twice in this review. Due to this, I've expanded my definition of the term Soulsborne to include other games like Sekiro that capture the essence of a Soulsborne game. But I'm still limiting the scope of the video to Soulsborne games actually made Made by the creators of the Soulsborne from software themselves. There are many other Soulsborne genre games out there made by other developers, but honestly that's just too much to cover in one video, so let me know if you do want to see a video about those games in the future. Let's get into the video, we'll start things off with a little retrospective history lesson on the background of the Soulsborne games, and then we'll get into the individual reviews. By the end of the video you'll know my thoughts on all of these games, and I'll even give them a rating in comparison to each other at the end. For those worried about spoilers, I'm not going to be going into any major major ones in this video, although I will be showing clips from a few boss battles, but I don't think it's going to be something that will ruin your experience if you haven't played the game before. If you're still concerned, there will be timestamps to skip the games that you haven't played yet. So with that out of the way, sit back and enjoy this feature film length video about one of the greatest video game franchises of all time. Soulsborne games were created by Japanese developer From Software, with the first game in the franchise, Demon's Souls, coming out in 2009 on the PlayStation 3. Demon's Souls, as well as the next title in the Soulsborne franchise, Dark Souls, were the first games to bring From Software international exposure on a grand scale. But FromSoft had a long history before this. From Software was established in 1986 as a developer for specialized business applications. They didn't become a video game developer until 1994 when they released their first game as a launch title on the original PlayStation. That game, Kingsfield, started a series of its own, which was the predecessor to the Soulsborne games. I find it slightly amusing that From Software's name is From Software, and they came from developing business software. Other than Kingsfield and Soulsborne games, From Software has a lot of other well-respected video game releases over the years, including but not limited to the Armored Core and Tenchu franchises, Evergrace, and of course, who could forget Metal Wolf Chaos. Since the beginning, FromSoft has self-published most of their games in Japan, but relied on third-party publishers for publishing their games outside of Japan. The first game they released outside of Japan was actually Kingsfield 2 in 1995, so they've been on the localization game for a while now. Unfortunately, they pulled a Final Fantasy and named Kingsfield 2 just Kingsfield in the United States because the original one never came out here. This did and still does create mass confusion regarding the series. There is an English fan translation of the original Kingsfield out now. Kingsfield is considered the predecessor to the Soulsborne because of its dark brooding atmosphere and its difficulty. A lesser known fact about Kingsfield is that it uses asset streaming technology similar to that in the Soulsborne games to eliminate loading times. That's all for background, so let's go ahead and get into the first Soulsborne game, Demon's Souls. But wait, real quick before we do, I'm going to put up a screen here showing the order I played the games in, because this could affect my opinion. I did play the best available version for each of these games, whether official or unofficial. So for the first Demon's Souls, I played it at 60 FPS in an emulator just a couple months before the PS5 version was announced and recently I played the PS5 version. And for Dark Souls 1, I played the remastered version with two graphics enhancement mods on it. For Dark Souls 2, I played the Scholar of the First Sin edition, and I also played all the DLCs for all these games. All right, so now let's get into it. In Demon's Souls, you play a hero that's ventured to the land of Balataria that has been ravaged by demons. Your motives are unclear, as they are in most of the Soulsborne games. All you know about Boletaria before arriving is that 
It was once a very prosperous kingdom led by King Alant. You also know that for unknown reasons, King Alant had woken the Old One from its slumber. The Old One could best be described as an entity with unfathomable power. Boletaria is cut off from the rest of the world with a thick fog. Those who venture in are never seen again. When you arrive at the thick fog wall surrounding Boletaria, a mysterious voice guides you to an opening. Once you're in, you fight some demons, and then you die. But one is never fully dead in Soulsborne games. Instead of just returning to a checkpoint or reloading your save, death is a full-blown mechanic in the Soulsborne games. When you die in Demon's Souls, your soul returns to the Nexus, which is kind of like a hub world. This is where you meet the Maiden in Black, which is the owner of the voice that guided you earlier. She has immense power, allowing her to chain your soul to the Nexus, making it so that when you die, you only lose your body form and any souls you had been carrying. She's doing this for you and the others you see in the Nexus in hopes that one day one of you will return peace and prosperity to Boletaria. While in soul form, there are three ways you can regain your body. The first is to kill a boss, the second is to use an item called a Stone of Ephemeral Eyes, and the third is to kill an online player. Demons grow stronger the more souls they consume, and similarly the player does as well. The Maiden in Black can use the souls you consume to alter your soul and level you up. Now that you have your bearings, you use the five working arch stones found around the Nexus to teleport to different places in Boletaria. When you set off, all you know is that you need to lull the old one back to sleep so that the world might be mended, which you don't really have a good idea of how to do that. But it's up to you to press on and reach your goal. If you die too much and give up, it's implied that you've gone mad and you will join the demons, just like the others have. Everyone seems to have a different Soulsborne game they consider the hardest. And while Demon's Souls was my first Soulsborne game, and typically the first Soulsborne game you play is your hardest. Demon's Souls was up there for me, but that's largely due to the fact that I did not understand the weapon scaling system whatsoever the first time I played it. My friends had tried to explain the weapon scaling system to me, but I just read it completely wrong, and I didn't realize I was reading it wrong until the beginning of Dark Souls 1. This means my build in Demon's Souls was a disaster. To make things even worse, the starting class I chose was the Knight, with the sword, but then eventually I realized I didn't like the sword and started using the halberd. Demon's Souls was the only Soulsborne game I used magic in other than Elden Ring, and in Demon's Souls I only used it for the heal spell so I could avoid grinding the healing items. Personally, I despise the tedium of grinding in single player games. Now recently I played the PS5 version of Demon's Souls for this review, and to my shock and awe, one of the starting classes, the Tower Knight, is exactly the same class I was trying to build off of the starting class, the Knight, in the original Demon Souls. I looked into it, and this Temple Knight class did exist in the original Demon Souls. So yeah, I just really made things way harder on myself in that first playthrough of this game. My one piece of advice for any new Soulsborne player is before even creating your character, look up how the scaling system works. The starting classes not only differ in the items they start with, but also the base stats. If you don't build your stats based on the type of weapon you want to use, you're gonna have a bad time. And this right here is why I think some people have such a hard time with the Soulsborne franchise. It does absolutely nothing to explain the weapon scaling system to you. All these games go for the minimalistic kind of tutorial, but I think at least upon opening the inventory for the first time, there should have been like a screen explaining the scaling system to you. As it stands, none of the games do this. And if it wasn't for my friends explaining this to me, I might have played through the whole series with disaster builds. All Soulsborne games are challenging, but there are certain aspects of some of the games that are more annoying and tedious than they are challenging. While all Soulsborne games punish you pretty heavily for dying, Demon's Souls is the only game in the franchise that gets immensely more difficult the more you die. One of the reasons for this is that while in soul form your max HP is halved unless you're wearing a special ring, but even then you only have something like 75% of your max health. To go back to body form and have your full max health, you have to do one of the three things I mentioned earlier. As you can imagine, killing a boss to resurrect when you're in soul form with 75% or even 50% of your max health is a lot harder than killing it with 100% of your max health. Additionally, the item you can use to get your body form back, the Stones of Ephemeral Eyes, are very rare. So if you're doing poorly, you can run out of these pretty fast. So that's one way the game ups the difficulty the more you die, but another way is through the World Tendency System. 
Each location in Boletaria has its own world tendency. This can shift to either white or black depending on your actions. You normally do not want to have black world tendency because this means the enemies deal more damage to you. And at a certain point, the game even starts spawning new glowing red versions of these enemies. The thing is, one of the actions that shifts the world tendency towards black is simply dying. So yeah, unlike the other games in the Souls series, Demon Souls actually ramps up the difficulty the worse you are at the game. This is just super unnecessary because you're already punished enough for dying. I mean, you lose all your souls when you die. So it's for this reason I wouldn't recommend newcomers to the franchise to start with Demon Souls. Story-wise, that isn't even really related to the other games in the franchise anyway, so you'll be fine with skipping it first and coming back to it later. Other than that, I still have some other minor complaints with this game. As I mentioned earlier, you're pretty much required to grind for healing items every now and then. And to do that, you basically use the Archstone to travel to world 1-3 and you kill these two knight enemies over and over again. Now on the PS5 loading times are minimal but on the PS3 even in an emulator the loading times were abysmal so grinding these two enemies took forever. Even on the PS5 it's annoying because well while you're doing it you're constantly thinking why are they making me do this instead of doing anything else that's more fun? This really shows off the beauty of the Estus recovery system in Dark Souls. Item recovery systems such as the one seen here in Demon's Souls as well as the one in Bloodborne will never be perfect because they have some major drawbacks. If the game decides to give you these items too frequently, then you'll be broken as you'll have an endless supply of them. If the game decides to give you these items too infrequently, then you'll just have to grind all the time and it will not be fun. This was a big problem in the PvP in the original Demon Souls because everybody was kind of expected to have an endless supply of healing items. It boiled down to, if you want to PvP, you pretty much have to grind a lot. I'm happy to say that in the remake, this issue with PvP has been mitigated slightly because the developers added weight to all of the healing items essentially meaning you can't carry an endless supply anymore. This change does make it so that you have to grind less if you want to participate in PvP, but you still have to grind just as much just playing single player. Aside from the item healing system, the weapon upgrade system also requires a fair bit of grinding due to the amount of materials required in this game versus the other Soulsborne games. This is also something that was left unaddressed in the PS5 version. So overall, the grinding in the PS5 version is less annoying and tedious than it ever was in the PS3 version, but the sad fact remains is that the grinding still exists, and in a game like this, I just find it super annoying. My next complaint about Demon's Souls comes from the length of the boss runs. Boss runs refer to the path you have to take to get back to the boss after dying to it. The boss runs in Demon's Souls are the most absurd boss runs in any of the Soulsborne games. While I would consider the bosses in Demon's Souls the easiest in the entire franchise, the areas I would consider to be the hardest in the entire franchise. A lot of the areas in Demon's Souls consist of small corridors filled with enemies you have to pass through to progress. Now sometimes you can find or open up short shortcuts, but a lot of times these shortcuts will be more dangerous than actually just taking the normal route. While these shortcuts do exist, there are never checkpoints between the beginning of an area and the boss of that area. This has the benefit of increasing that feeling you get when completing an area. Finally overcoming World 1-2 and World 5-1 are gaming moments that I will never forget. But looking back on it, I do recognize the game really does waste a lot of your time by not placing checkpoints anywhere remotely near the bosses. This combined with the sheer difficulty of the areas and the crazy loading times on PS3 made for a very annoying experience to say the least. This is another aspect helped by the great loading times on the PS5. But the runs are still very long and sometimes it just feels wrong when you end up dying to the area more than you end up dying to the bosses. These areas are the true bosses of Demon's Souls. Now for the good. Demon's Souls is one of the more memorable experiences I had with the Soulsborne franchise. Just because I complained about the area difficulty earlier in the video doesn't mean that I think the level design is bad. The level design is excellent. Along the way, you'll find yourself scaling massive towers, finding your way through mineshaft mazes, or navigating the filth and sludge in a place called the Valley of Defilement. Each world you visit feels unique in its own right, and each area in each world also has its own unique feeling to it. This aspect is present in most Soulsborne games, but this is the one that started it all, and it's quite impressive that they nailed this aspect on the first try. Unlike the Dark Souls games, Demon's Souls, the Demon's Souls remake, 
and Bloodborne were all made in partnership with Sony. And as we all know, games that Sony has a hand in typically have amazing graphics. Demon Souls PS5 looks outstanding, and even the PS3 Demon Souls when it came out was no slouch either. But this PS5 remake, if you would call it that, has definitely brought the graphics into the next generation. Pretty much everything in the graphics department, meshes, textures, lighting effects, has been overhauled aside from the general map layouts which have remained pretty much the same. The sound and sound design has also been overhauled and it just sounds incredible and the music is still some of my favorite music in the entire series. Now let's talk bosses. There are some great bosses in Demon's Souls like the Flame Lurker, the Penetrator, and Old King Alant. These boss fights can really test your skill, but most other times the boss fights themselves are just too easy. Even when they are easy though, they are still memorable because most of the time you'll end up dying to the easy bosses a couple of times, and their designs are just so unique and memorable on their own. But there are at least two boss fights I can think of that are awful and should have been fixed in the PS5 version. The Armor Spider and Dragon God boss fights are boss fights that should have been reworked and I don't think anyone would have complained about it. Yes, the Dragon God I'm referring to is the one in the trailer and unfortunately his boss fight is still terrible in the PS5 version. Speaking of that, I do need to give my thoughts regarding the remake in comparison to the original. This will only lightly factor into my review and I'll explain why here in a moment. I struggle to call the PS5 version of Demon's Souls a remake rather than a remaster. Yes, I know, the graphics are vastly improved, the sound is improved, there are little tiny gameplay enhancements here and there, but it's largely the same game and there's absolutely no reason to play it other than nostalgia for people who played the original. I wouldn't have a problem with this if the game wasn't selling for $70 new. Frankly, I felt a little bit ripped off even buying this to play it for this review. That being said, if you haven't played Demon's Souls before, this is the best way to play the game. But still, even you should expect a little bit more from a game selling for $70 that is essentially the exact same as the game that came out in 2009. They did not add any new content other than a secret door with a new armor set hidden behind it. They could have fixed the broken arch stone and added an entirely new location. They could have even added new content elsewhere and expanded the current maps. They could have entirely reworked the armor spider and dragon god boss fights, but they chose not to do any of these things. In my opinion, Demon's Souls PS5 is somewhere between a remake and a remaster, but it's not really either one of those. The graphical upgrades are greater than any other remaster I've seen, but at the same time, not enough gameplay-wise has changed to classify it as a remake. It's better if I give you some examples of games that fit these categories than it is for me to try to explain this to you if you have no frame of reference. There are re-releases like Persona 5 Royal where they include a bunch of extra content, but it releases on the same system and there are no graphical improvements. Meanwhile, The Last of Us Remastered is a classic example of a remaster. It's a re-release on a newer system with slightly upgraded graphics and the DLC included, but that's it. We also have remakes where the entire game is remade, like Final Fantasy VII Remake. In this example, the game went from being very two-dimensional to full 3D, and the underlying gameplay changed entirely. But at the same time, they also stuck to the original story for the most part. And in our last category, we have reboots like Prey 2017, where the game is just an entirely different game than the original, story included. Demon's Souls is more than just a re-release, but it's less than a reboot. More than a remaster, as they actually remade a lot of these assets, but less than a remake because they didn't really change the underlying gameplay whatsoever and they added no new additional content. And because none of the actual level design has even changed and because all of the character movement pretty much feels the same except for the addition of omnidirectional rolling, it almost seems like they just upgraded the engine a bit and overhauled the graphics and sound. Such a scenario would mean that this game has the DNA of the original Demon's Souls, this would mean Sony and Bluepoint saved time by not having to actually remake any of the levels or game mechanics, and instead all they had to do was put an asset team onto remaking these assets. And I really wouldn't have a problem with this either, except for the fact that Bluepoint and Sony marketed this game as a remake. 
Now because like all games, this game will eventually go down in price and you'll be able to get it for cheaper, and also because this is meant to be a long running review in the sense that I will update this video and re-release this video as new games in the series are released. I'm not going to factor in that I think Sony and Bluepoint lied about this game being a remake into my final review score, but I thought I would mention this here anyway. Let's get back on track though and we'll talk about the story for a second. The story in Demon's Souls, like in all Soulsborne games, is told passively, meaning it's not really in your face and telling you exactly as to what's going on, it's more hinting at things which then you can draw your own conclusions from. From Software seems to love this style of storytelling, and it seems to work well for them. The lore in all the Soulsborne games is really deep, and in Demon's Souls specifically, the story feels a little bit more focused and less disjointed than in some of the other Soulsborne games. It's pretty easy to follow. And even though you don't really know your player character's motivations, your adventure still feels like this epic quest to save the kingdom, where you're just this tiny being going up against monstrosities the size of buildings sometimes, where you're overcoming all odds to get to the next area. I also love how stoic it all is. You can die as many times as you want, but the only way to lose is to quit playing. And trust me, in all of these games, there will be times you will want to quit playing. But the game really does instill this thought into you that if you give up and quit playing, then you have failed. No matter how hard the game got, this is what kept me going. The game did a great job at making me want to finish it. And when I did, it was oh so satisfying. Lastly, let's talk about the combat. Combat in the original Demon Souls felt a little bit clunky due to the animations, but simply by changing the animations in the PS5 version, everything feels a lot nicer. Additionally, in the original Demon Souls, you were not able to roll in all directions, and now you can, which does make combat feel a little bit easier to manage. Combat in the Soulsborne games consists of a lock-on mechanic that you can choose to use or not use depending on the type of enemy you're fighting, although normally you would want to use it. And then the other big part of Soulsborne combat is the dodging and blocking. You can also counterattack your enemy by parrying at the right time, and instead of dodging the attack completely, you can phase right through an enemy's attack by dodging at the right time. The Soulsborne combat system is very satisfying, and in Demon Souls it is no different. Finally, let's talk about performance. On the original PS3, Demon Souls ran at a not-so-stable 30 FPS. Now on the PS5 it runs at a glorious 60 FPS. The difference between 30 and 60 FPS is a massive difference for me. But I did get to play the original Demon's Souls at 60 FPS because I did play it in an emulator. So playing the PS5 version I really didn't get the additional benefits from that. But as you'll see later on in this video when we talk about another game, performance does make a huge difference in these Soulsborne games where reaction times are everything. So let's get down to my review score. I'm going to give the best version of Demon's Souls, the PS5 version, an 8 out of 10. In conclusion, it's held back from achieving a higher score on my scale due to the fact that it vastly increases the difficulty the worse you are at the game, it has unnecessary healing and crafting item grinding, it has the two terrible armor spider and dragon god boss fights, and it has the longest boss runs of any game in the franchise. But the epic scale of the grand adventure and deep lore and the amazing graphics make up for all of that. If you're new, I wouldn't play it until you've looked into the scaling system and maybe even played a different Soulsborne game first. But if you have, I would definitely give it a go. Demon's Souls is a great game. On to Dark Souls 1. Dark Souls 1 was the second game in the Soulsborne franchise and it came out in 2011. There was also a remaster that came out in 2018. The only experience I had with the original Dark Souls was when I got it for free on the Xbox 360 and wanted to co-op it with a friend. I played about two hours of it and I didn't really have any interest in playing it solo, so I gave up when the game just would not let us connect with each other for whatever reason. Because I don't have much experience with the original, I'm not really qualified to compare the two editions. But I did hear there was no way to play the original version in 60 FPS without a mod, even though the original game did come out on all platforms including PC. Other than the frame rate, I heard the upgrades were overall pretty minimal and they left some bugs unfixed even, but this really doesn't bother me because they did call the game a remaster and not a remake or something of the sort. And while I'm less qualified to talk about it than I am Demon's Souls, it does seem like there's no reason to play this version of the game if you've already played the old version of the game. Dark Souls starts with this opening cutscene you see here that explains the world's history. Dragons once ruled the land in the Age of Ancients, 
Eventually, a fire known as the first flame manifested in the world. This drew a distinction in the world between heat and cold, life and death, light and dark. And it describes how four beings came out of the dark and found the Lord Souls near the first flame. Three of the four holders of the Lord Souls took on the dragons, and they won with the help of Seath the Scaleless, a dragon that betrayed his own kind. This brought in the Age of Fire. But fire can only last for so long, and this flame is about to burn out. If it does, it will bring on the Age of Dark. As for your character, you wake up in a cell. You're an undead branded by the Dark Sign. The Dark Sign returns you to the last place you rested at when you die, although it doesn't prevent you from losing the humanity and souls that you've gathered. The more humanity you have, the more resistant to things you are. Additionally, you can use humanity to restore your human form so you're not undead anymore. This comes at the cost of opening up your world to invasions from other players. There's an opening in your cell above you, and this is where Oscar of Astora drops drops a key down to you for you to get out. After navigating your way through the Undead Asylum, you open a path after dodging out of the way of a rolling boulder that's coming at you. Inside you find Oscar, who has seemingly given up on life after being smashed through the floor by the Asylum Demon. He gives you an Estus Flask. This is the main way of recovering your health throughout all of the Dark Souls games. The Estus Flask is an item you can use a set amount of times that replenishes when you rest at bonfires. It's presumed that you fill the flask with embers from the bonfires. After slaying the Asylum demon and reaching the end of the undead asylum, a giant crow appears and takes you off to the land of Lordran. You end up at Firelink Shrine. Here you meet a crestfallen warrior who has almost given up on life and become hollow. He doesn't explain why, but he says that you need to ring two bells of awakening, the first being up high and the second being deep underground. Similar to the previous game Demon Souls, you can die as many times as you want, but the only way to lose is to give up and go hollow. Hollowed essentially means you've gone mad. So with little more than that, you set off on your adventure to ring the two bells of awakening. Firelink Shrine isn't really a hub world like the Nexus and Demon Souls, it's more of a central crossroads. All paths lead to Firelink Shrine, and at Firelink Shrine there is a bonfire. Unlike in Demon Souls where you're forced to level up by talking to an NPC, you you can actually level up from any bonfire in the world. This is very convenient as you don't have to go through a loading screen if you want to level up your character. Because there isn't a hub world per se and because you can't fast travel between bonfires until you get the Lord Vessel halfway through the game, Dark Souls 1 puts a heavy emphasis on exploration. Bonfires are your checkpoints, and if you don't explore enough, you can miss them. At Firelink, there are initially three branching paths you can take. But unlike Demon Souls, these paths are not linear. They lead from one area to the next, and they can even interconnect with each other at points. There are many cases where you can look out into the distance and see a place that you've been before. And while I wouldn't personally classify any Soulsborne games as open world games other than Elden Ring, Dark Souls 1 does a really good job at making you feel like it is an open world game. The world design here is top notch. Just like Demon Souls, the areas you explore in Dark Souls are all pretty unique from one another actually more so. For example, when venturing underground, you go from what is like a sewer system to a decaying town underneath that to a poison swamp. Then eventually you'll get to what feels like the core of the earth with lava everywhere. While down here, you'll think back to the previous areas and you'll be like, holy crap, I'm deep in the earth. This feeling amazes me because you didn't teleport there or ride an elevator there. You walked all the way there. Because the paths you take can end up being so long, you'll quickly learn that you actually have to prepare for your journey a lot. Dark Souls 1 does have a weapon durability mechanic, and before getting the Lord Vessel, you do not want to end up far away from a blacksmith with a broken weapon and no repair items. I like durability mechanics in video games because it does incentivize you to plan ahead. Demon Souls also has this mechanic, but it's not very important because there is a blacksmith at the Nexus hub world. Dark Souls 1 is the only game in the series where I felt like I needed to worry about my durability in. They kept making this mechanic easier and easier, until Elden Ring when they removed it entirely. Dark Souls 1 also seemed to utilize enemy weaknesses and resistances more than Demon Souls did. This might also just be due to the wider variety of enemies. Regardless of why, I was forced to change my tactics in Dark Souls 1 more than I was in Demon Souls. Changing my tactics in Dark Souls was also easier than in Demon Souls because of the revised weapon upgrade system. Without grinding, by the end of Dark Souls I actually had two fully upgraded weapons. Unlike in Demon Souls where I only had one and I also had to grind for that. In Dark Souls I did a great sword build so I had two great swords, a regular one and 
one with lightning and fusion. And by the second half of the game, I found myself switching between these two quite a bit. I really struggled to find anything wrong with the gameplay in Dark Souls 1. The lack of omnidirectional rolling didn't really bother me in the original Demon Souls, and it doesn't bother me here either. The introduction of the Estus recovery system throws grinding for healing items out the window. All you have to do to get your healing back is go back to a bonfire. Just like Demon Souls, Dark Souls also has two missteps with its bosses. The first being Ceaseless Discharge and his broken hitbox, as well as the Bed of Chaos. I'd argue that these bosses aren't as bad as the Armor Spider and the Dragon God and Demon Souls, but they are still pretty bad. Unlike Demon Souls though, Dark Souls makes up for this with the amount of amazing boss fights it has. I could only name three from Demon Souls, but Dark Souls had the Bell Gargoyles, Quaylog, Four Kings, Nido, Ornstein and Smo, Gwyn, Artorius, Black Dragon Calamit, and the hardest boss in the entire Souls franchise, in my opinion, Manus, Father of the Abyss, who I fought for four to five hours before beating. So yeah, if you're looking for unforgettable boss fights, Dark Souls 1 has that. But honestly, this isn't the reason that I kept playing these games. For me, it was the exploration and grand scale of the world, as well as the varied areas that you travel through, that kept me coming back. The exploration is so good that I never felt like it was a waste of time to explore an area. While Demon's Souls merely introduced the mechanic but didn't use it a lot, Dark Souls 1 makes heavy use of illusory walls. Illusory walls are illusions that look exactly like the rest of the wall, and if you hit one, it opens up, revealing what's behind it. If you open up enough of these, you might just find an optional boss or even a full area hidden behind it. But beyond that, there's even secret areas you can get to by doing things in a particular order. Even what was once the DLC in the original Dark Souls is hidden. It contains massive areas and three bosses, and you can only get to it if you do things in a particular order. I wasn't playing Dark Souls with a guide, so when I found one of these areas on my own just through exploring, it felt very rewarding. Upon finishing the game and discussing with my friends, I found that one of my friends hadn't even found one of the areas that I did while playing. So to recap what we've gone over so far, exploration and general gameplay are amazing, map design is incredible, the bosses are also outstanding. So let's touch on the graphics and sound. Let's be upfront about the graphics. I played with two graphic enhancement mods and I recommend everybody else does as well. They were easy to install and they make the game look so much better. With or without them turned on, I would still say Dark Souls is a very pretty looking game. I would say Dark Souls 3 and newer Soulsborne games definitely look better than Dark Souls 1, but it definitely beats the crap out of Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin Edition, and it even looks better than Bloodborne at most times, even though Bloodborne has the high resolution textures and meshes, for reasons that I will explain when I get into the Bloodborne review. The amazing variety of detailed environments in Dark Souls does play into how well the game looks. And in many cases, you're just in awe at the environments rather than focusing on the low res meshes and textures. In the sound department, Dark Souls has some very arcadey feeling sound effects, which really feel at home alongside the arcadey difficulty. When it comes to the soundtrack, Dark Souls has less standout tracks to me than Demon's Souls did, but I would say they are of all around greater quality. As for the story in Dark Souls, I'd say that the story is a little bit more unfocused than the story of Demon Souls. The things you're doing in Dark Souls up until the point you meet Framped, you've just done all because some rando told you to without really explaining why. That being said, the lore here is still pretty incredible if you read into it. So overall, I enjoyed the storytelling in Dark Souls a lot. It was also the most memorable game in the series for me. I'm going to give Dark Souls, and more specifically Dark Souls Remastered, the version I played, a 10 out of 10. This isn't for the improvements or lack of improvements in Remastered. If rating the game based on the improvements in Remastered, I would have to give it a lower score than that. Instead, this is based on the Dark Souls experience as a whole, and let me tell you, Dark Souls 1 is a game I think everybody should play at some point. On my scale, a 10 out of 10 does not mean the game is perfect, as if you look hard enough with any game, you could probably find somewhere that it could be improved. Instead, a 10 out of 10 rating on my scale means that the game is a must-play game, and I thoroughly enjoyed almost every minute of this game. So yeah, my first 10 out of 10 on my channel goes to Dark Souls 1. Let's move on to Dark Souls 2. Dark Souls 2 came out in 2014, shortly after the release of the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One. It appears From Software was not ready for these consoles, as the game didn't come out on them until a year later when the Scholar of the First Sin edition came out. Scholar of the First Sin is both an update and a remaster. It first came out for the PS3, Xbox 360, and PC, 
in the form of a free update with a bunch of little small welcome changes included, but it lacked any changes that would allow you to call it a remaster like the enhanced graphics. The Scholar of the First Sin edition that you've seen on PS3 or Xbox 360 should not be confused with the Scholar of the First Sin edition that you see on Xbox One or PS4. This edition you see on Xbox 360 or PlayStation 3 is simply a bundle that includes all the DLC as well as that Scholar of the First Sin update. It is not the full-fledged Scholar of the First Sin edition. Two months after this came out, the real Scholar of the First Sin edition came out on PS4, Xbox One, and PC. I mistakenly bought both versions of Dark Souls 2, so I have both, and I can tell you, the difference between the original Dark Souls 2 and the Scholar of the First Sin edition is not that great. With Scholar, you get all DLCs included, revised enemy placements, and some graphical upgrades such as with the lighting. Unfortunately, either somebody from Bandai Namco or somebody from From Software decided they didn't want to give this away to current PC players for free. They charged a $20 upgrade price if you owned all the DLC for the original Dark Souls 2, and a $30 price if you didn't. I can maybe understand charging for this if you didn't own all the DLC before, but other than that, it just feels like a greedy move. These upgrades are just not worth that price. And similarly to Demon Souls PS5 and Dark Souls Remastered, if you've played the original Dark Souls 2, you have no reason to buy the Scholar of the First Sin edition. Dark Souls 2 begins with the opening video you see here. It explains that long ago a great king built a great kingdom called Drang Lake. And it predicts that you'll find yourself standing before the gate of Drang Lake without really knowing why. Just like in Dark Souls 1, you're an undead brand by the dark sign. You're cursed to fight for souls and die over and over again until you go hollow. You wake up in things betwixt and you find a house with three old fire keepers in it. For the first time in the Soulsborne series, here you get background information about your character, although it is pretty minimal. You've come here to break the curse. The Firekeepers don't tell you how to do so, but they explain that you must venture on towards the kingdom if you want to have any hope at doing so. Traveling onward, you eventually get to Majula. Majula is Dark Souls 2's Firelink Shrine. Here you'll find some buildings, NPCs, a bonfire, and most importantly the Emerald Herald. Unlike in Dark Souls 1 where you can level up from any bonfire, on fire, she's your means of leveling up. She gives you an Estus Flask and explains that the only way to break the undead curse is to obtain the four great souls held by old ones. So with that, you set off on your adventure. You might be noticing a pattern here. The story is very similar to Dark Souls 1's story so far. Dark Souls 2, however, tells its story in a very fairy tale like manner, if that makes any sense. So even though it does sound very similar to the story in the first game, it didn't feel that way while I was playing it. What I did feel, however, immediately upon moving my character were the tank controls. I mean, the actual control scheme didn't change much from the first game, but for whatever reason, your character just feels a lot more clunky. I can't pinpoint the exact reason why, but if I had to guess, it's probably because From Software was experimenting with movement at the time. Dark Souls 2 was the first game in the series to have omnidirectional rolling, and it was also the first game to make dual wielding viable. So yeah, it's quite possible that somewhere along the way they made the character feel more clunky while they were implementing these things. On a somewhat related note, in Dark Souls 2, they appear to have slowed down the gameplay in various aspects quite a bit. This time, drinking Estus does not heal you immediately, instead it heals you quickly over time. On the surface, a small change like this might seem irrelevant, but it really does slow the whole game down as all the enemies are balanced for this, meaning most of the enemies feel slower than in previous games. But just because the enemies feel slower doesn't mean the player character's attack animations feel any slower than in previous games, even if your movement does does feel a little more sluggish. To compensate for the slower enemies in Dark Souls 2, it appears FromSoft simply added more enemies. Dark Souls 2 constantly forces you down narrow corridors filled with these guys. And often there are hiding enemies that you'll walk by and they'll pop out of nowhere from behind you just to gank you. It happens so much in Dark Souls 2 that my friend group gave Dark Souls 2 the nickname Gank Souls. Just like in Demon Souls and Dark Souls 2, I found myself dying to the areas more than I did the bosses most of the time. It seems that at some point during testing, From Software realized this was a problem, so they made it so you can despawn enemies if you kill them a certain amount of times. I believe you have to kill the same enemy 12 times for it to stop spawning again. I don't consider myself amazing at Dark Souls, but I'm also not terrible at it, and yet I had to resort to this method to get past the Smelter Demon in the Iron Keep because of all the guards in front of it. This despawning feature is exclusive to Dark Souls 2, 
and I'm conflicted on whether I like it or not. On one hand, this feature rewards players who aren't very good at the game with progression as long as they are persistent. But on the other hand, I do feel like some of the areas relied on this feature. And it's in those instances where I feel like they should have just designed the area properly rather than relying on the despawning of enemies. Speaking of areas, the areas in Dark Souls 2 are just as varied as in Dark Souls 1, but they're not as detailed. A lot of the time in Dark Souls 2, you'll find yourself running through empty rooms with stone walls, stone ceilings, and stone floors. And in Dark Souls 2, there are less instances where you can just look out in the distance and see a place you've already been to before. And the graphics really don't help. There are times that I felt the original Demon Souls in an emulator looked better than this game. Other than the fact that many areas just aren't very detailed, when it comes to graphics, I think there are two reasons for this. One is the colors aren't very vibrant like they were in Dark Souls 1, leading to many areas feeling samey even if they're not. And the second thing is the anti-aliasing which is terrible in this game. There are many many jagged edges and this might not be a big deal to you but it really is to me. When a game has bad aliasing it really brings me out of the experience because from the point I notice it onward I just can't stop noticing it. At one point I even started work on a grass mod because the aliasing in this game makes the grass look awful. After actually finishing the game though I realized I didn't like the game enough so I've decided I'm not going to continue work on that mod. Now that we've talked about graphics, it's time to talk about sound. The sound effects in this game sound really low resolution. If you can ignore that and look past the quality they were recorded in, you'll notice that they are just okay even then. Definitely nothing special about them. Sound effects aside, I really enjoyed the soundtrack. I still wouldn't say I enjoyed it as much as the Demon Souls soundtrack, but it does have more standout tracks than Dark Souls 1. But soundtracks are pretty subjective, so let's move on to something else we can talk about here in more detail which are the boss fights. Just like the other Soulsborne games, Dark Souls 2 does have its standout boss fights like the Burnt Ivory King, Fume Knight, Dark Lurker, Aldia, Sin the Slumbering Dragon, and perhaps my favorite boss in the entire series, Sir Alone. Eh, maybe not. He does have a broken hitbox. Dark Souls 2 also has its fair share of gimmick boss fights, but they're done much better here than in previous games, like with the Executioner's Chariot. It does have the same problem Demon Souls had, where a lot of the bosses are just too easy. But off the top of my head, I couldn't think of any truly egregious boss fights in this one, like I could with the previous two games. That doesn't mean it's all good in the boss department though. Dark Souls 2 has an absurd amount of repeat bosses, either from Dark Souls 1 or from literally the same game. The repeat bosses, the absurd amount of enemies they place in these small corridors, and the lack of detail in many of the areas leads me to believe that they just tried their hardest to pad out this game. And when those three things come together, Together, part of me really thinks the game wasn't finished. The best example I can give to prove to you that Dark Souls 2 is unfinished is that it contains the worst area in the entire Soulsborne franchise, or perhaps any game ever. The frigid outskirts is the most poorly designed piece of shit level ever conceived. And while the area itself is optional, if you want to beat all the bosses, you have to go through this hellhole. The area consists of a snowy wasteland where you just have to walk from one side to the other, but it blizzards at random points, and if you're caught in a blizzard, these reindeers will show up and just wreck your day. Even though there's nothing here but ruins of buildings, it takes forever to walk from one side to the other, and you have to constantly stop and wait inside of these ruins until the current blizzard is finished for you to continue on your way and there are no checkpoints between the beginning of the area and the end of the area. So yeah, garbage area. And to make matters worse, what boss fight do you get at the end of it? Well, you would hope it would be a cool one, right? Nope, it's just a repeat boss fight, but this time it's a gank fight. Other than feeling incomplete, Dark Souls 2 also brought back the most hated feature from Demon Souls, the fact that you lose your max HP the more you die. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not as invasive as it was in Demon Souls, but why did they think this a good idea to bring back in any way, shape, or form? I get that the game is balanced for it, but still, it's just not a good feeling to not have your max HP. In Demon Souls, you lose 50% of your max HP when you die. In Dark Souls 2, you lose 10% each time you die up to a maximum of 50% of your maximum health lost. In Demon Souls, the item that revives you to human form is called the Stone of Ephemeral Eyes, and this is what gets you back your max HP. While you don't lose your max HP in Dark Souls 1, 
there was still a revival item called a humanity that allowed you to restore your human form. In Dark Souls 2, this item is called a human effigy, and it's the first time a revival item doesn't also heal you to max HP when you use it. This is probably because Dark Souls 2 not only has the item healing system of Demon Souls in the form of life gems, but it also has the Estus recovery system that was seen in Dark Souls 1. Unlike in Demon Souls, you can find these healing items, the life gems, pretty frequently and you can buy them for very cheap as well. Because of how easy they are to get and the fact that your character doesn't have to stop moving to use them, you'll find yourself popping these like candy. There were times I felt like I was never going to run out of health because I just had so many of these. But unlike in Demon's Souls, you can't use these healing items in PvP, so you don't have to worry about grinding for them if you want to partake. So where does Dark Souls 2 fall on my scale? Well, I did enjoy the story and the soundtrack quite a bit. There were some epic boss fights and there weren't any truly terrible boss fights, and it still had that classic Dark Souls gameplay to it. But there were a lot of things holding this game back. It didn't feel finished and it felt padded out. There are tons of repeat bosses. They brought back the Demon Souls max HP degradation. The sound effects were lackluster. The graphics are poor, and it had the worst area ever conceived in a Souls game. For all of that put together, I'm going to give Dark Souls 2 a six and a half out of 10. Just like the other Soulsborne games, it's a very memorable experience, but I found myself remembering it for all the wrong reasons. Don't get me wrong, I did have a good time with this game, but the simple fact of the matter is this is just the worst Souls game, and I would only recommend you play it if you played all the other Souls games and are just looking for more. And with that, let's hop on over to the Born part of the Soulsborne franchise, Bloodborne. Bloodborne came out in 2015 for the PlayStation 4 in between the releases of the Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin update and the Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin edition. Bloodborne is what I think of when I think of the first modern Soulsborne video game. Everything between Demon's Souls and Dark Souls 2 kind of felt last gen and that's because, well, it was. This was the first game in the franchise targeting an 8th generation console. This came with it vastly improved graphics, including higher resolution textures and meshes, and the most detailed environments ever seen in a Soulsborne game. A new generation also came with it more fluid movement, and maybe taking criticism from Dark Souls 2, From Software decided to make Bloodborne the fastest game in the Soulsborne series yet, and they even stuck with this fast fluid movement for Dark Souls 3, although Dark Souls 3 is overall a slower game than Bloodborne. Bloodborne begins with your character, the hunter, waking up in a clinic getting a blood transfusion from a blood minister. Like Dark Souls 2, Bloodborne also gives you some character backstory. You're afflicted by an unknown disease, thus you've traveled to this clinic here in Yarnum to search for pale blood which is rumored to be able to cure any disease. The blood minister warns you that you'll be going on a strange journey that may seem like a bad dream. Upon receiving the blood transfusion, your character sees visions of terrible monsters. Then your character wakes up and finds a note saying to seek the pale blood and transcend the the hunt. Upon attempting to leave the clinic, your character is killed and you go to a place called the Hunter's Dream. This is similar to the Nexus in Demon's Souls, however instead of arch stones, there are gravestones. It serves as your hub world, it's where you level up and it's also where you teleport to various areas around Yarnum. This is where you meet Germin and the Plain Doll. Germin simply tells you that this is now your home and to enjoy the hunt. And the plain doll tells you that she can use blood that you gather from your slain enemies to channel your strength and level you up. Blood echoes are for Bloodborne what souls are for souls games. They level you up, but also you can lose them if you die. You have one shot at retrieving them, but unlike in the souls games, enemies can actually pick up your blood echoes, in which case you have to kill the enemy that picked up your blood echoes to get them back. Unfortunately for your character, while Yarnum might hold the secret of pale blood that you've been looking for, it's also home to an illness that transforms its citizens into beast-like creatures. So with that information and your inability to fully die, you set off on your adventure to find pale blood and transcend the hunt. Bloodborne's story is very different from any of the Souls games, and it's also a lot more cryptic. It is very similar to Dark Souls 2 in the sense that you're trying to cure a disease slash curse, but it doesn't straight up tell you like, hey, you need to go kill these four great beings to do so. For much of the game, your objectives are unclear, even more so than in Souls entries. On one hand, I like this because it adds to the mystery of the universe, but on the other hand, it also added to the feelings the game gave me of why am I doing this? And let me tell you, this game had a lot of these moments and not just related to the story either. Bloodborne does away with the Estus-style recovery system as seen in Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2, 
and it opts for that item recovery system that Demon Souls had. Blood vials are your healing items in Bloodborne. And unlike in Demon Souls where you can carry a seemingly endless number of healing supplies with you as long as you have the weight for it, Bloodborne caps the amount of blood vials you can carry on you at a time to 20. Although there are a few upgrades you can get to increase the cap a little. As I said earlier, Bloodborne is the fastest paced Soulsborne game and as such you're allowed to use the blood vials as you're moving. You can get more blood vials simply by finding them as enemy drops or you can buy them using blood echoes. This blood vial system was the first major issue I had with Bloodborne. I was using blood vials so much faster than the game gave them to me. This required me to grind probably 10 times more than I had to grind in Demon Souls and I didn't even feel like I was doing worse than I was in Demon Souls. For the first half of the game I would have to go to the bridge in central Yarnum and kill these two werewolf enemies over and over and over again just to get restocked on blood vials. And because this game is a PS4 exclusive, the loading times were atrocious. Actually, they were atrocious even for PS4 games. The footage you see here is of Bloodborne being played on PS5. As you can probably tell, there is no PS5 patch for this game. On PS5, the loading times are improved, but they could have been improved further had it gotten a PS5 patch. So yeah, the amount of grinding you have to do combined with the loading times leads to that feeling of, why is this game making me do this when I could be doing literally anything else that is more fun? This is the same feeling I had in Demon's Souls, only multiplied by 10. Now Bloodborne is many people's favorite game in the Soulsborne series, and as such I can already hear people ready their keyboards to type their get good comments? The answer is yes, if you're very good at the game you won't have to do grinding more than likely, but is that a realistic expectation for someone on their first playthrough? And I ask you to honestly tell me how much you had to grind on your first playthrough. If you had to at any point then you'll see where I'm coming from. Later on in the game grinding for me got better as I realized you can do chalice dungeons to get blood vials faster. And this brings me to my next issue with the game which is really more of a result of the platform that this game is locked to. Chalice dungeons are dungeons you can go to located underneath the city of Yarnum. Some are procedurally generated and others are fixed, but even the fixed ones feel procedurally generated because of how lackluster they are. They repeat the same rooms over and over and over again, maybe changing up the enemies, but still same rooms repeating over and over again for a very, very long time. And you have to do these chalice dungeons if you want to beat all the bosses. Playing through the chalice dungeons, it's obvious who they're meant for. They're meant for players that want to do co-op without affecting the main game world. But doing them solo is just no fun. I actually initially bought Bloodborne because I wanted to play co-op with a friend, but we had tried and it let us connect one time and after that, it would not let us connect to each other no matter what we did. On PlayStation 4, you're required to pay a subscription fee to play with friends online. Console subscription fees like this are kind of a scam and I honestly don't know how gamers let the console manufacturers get away with this. But regardless, I paid the fee for one month just to play this game with my friend and it didn't even work properly. If online co-op works for you, that's great, but in Bloodborne, it doesn't change the fact that you have to pay a fee to even remotely enjoy half the content in this game, that being the Chalice Dungeons. Like Demon's Souls, this game was made in partnership with Sony, so it doesn't surprise me that they did this here. But in Demon's Souls, I didn't feel like I had to pay a monthly fee to fully enjoy the game like I did here. The Chalice Dungeons are made even more disgusting by the fact you have to go through the Defiled Chalice Dungeon to be able to see all the bosses. The Defiled Chalice Dungeon has you fight repeat bosses with half your health, leading to the watchdog of the old lords and the amygdala that weren't so threatening before, becoming the hardest bosses in the entire game and even contenders for hardest bosses in the entire series. The chalice dungeons were another instance of me feeling like, why is the game making me do this when I could be doing anything else more fun? And okay, I guess the game wasn't making me do the chalice dungeons, but for this video I vowed to defeat all the bosses, which meant I kinda had to for this video. Because I recognize that they could possibly be fun if you can get co-op working, I'll go a little easy on them, but it still doesn't change the fact you have to pay a fee to fully enjoy them, and it also doesn't change the fact that when I tried to do that, it still didn't work properly. Like the Chalice Dungeons, my final major complaint with Bloodborne stems from the platform it's locked to. Bloodborne is currently locked to 30 FPS regardless of if you play it on PS4, PS4 Pro, or PS5. Even though the footage you see here is of it on PS5, I did originally play it on base PS4, 
And let me tell you, it does not hold a constant 30 FPS on base PS4 even. On PS5 though, it does seem to get a constant 30. I'm just basing this off of what my eyes see, not really on anything scientific, but that's what it looks like to me. 30 FPS is just not acceptable for the fastest game in the Soulsborne franchise, since if you were playing at 60 FPS on PC for the other games, you're literally getting half the amount of frames to react to things in Bloodborne. The 30 FPS on its own might not be a deal breaker to you, as some people are more sensitive to this than others. But for me, it was a major hindrance because I'm mainly a PC gamer and I came from playing the other Soulsborne games on PC at 60 FPS. To add on to the FPS problem, Bloodborne also has an aliasing problem and it's very noticeable if you look at any of the fences in the game. The developers most likely used a very hardware inexpensive anti-aliasing solution. It works on some objects but on others it very obviously doesn't and can even introduce shimmering artifacting. Motion blur is a very common game effect added by game developers to 30 FPS games to make their movement look more fluid. Sony loves this effect and if done right it can really improve the look of a 30 FPS game. This effect can probably be seen in any 30 FPS Sony published game on the PS4. Unfortunately though, Bloodborne looks a little bit too blurry. It's as if they cranked up the blur to 11 to try and hide the terrible frame rates on the base PS4 and to hide their terrible anti-aliasing method. But it really didn't help hide either of these two things and it really only served to make the game blurrier. Considering this is a lot of people's favorite Soulsborne game, it's really a shame that it's locked to the PS4 platform. I'd like to see at the very least a PS5 update for this game that allows you to play at 60 FPS. You know, like the one they made for Days Gone or Ghost of Tsushima. But I'll make an educated guess and say that this game probably won't get that because, well, it's an older game and on top of that, Sony does have a history of updating older games and re-releasing them for newer platforms for the cash flow. I fully expect a Bloodborne re-release of sorts for that cash grab sometime in the near future. And I don't expect a PS5 patch for the PS4 version at any point. Now there is a modder who released a 60 FPS mod for Bloodborne recently, but it does require a hacked PS4 or PS4 Pro. I sold my PS4 to get a PS5, so I have no way of running this mod right now. I suspect most people are in the same boat because of the accessibility of console modding, so I can't really factor this into my review right now. The mod does prove that 60 FPS is viable in Bloodborne. So come on from Software and Sony, get a couple developers together and make this game run at 60 FPS, why don't you? Oh, and upgrade the AA and dial back on the blur while you're at it. Thanks. So yeah, it's a shame, but these graphical issues combined really brought me out of the experience. Now I keep talking about how Bloodborne is a lot faster than the other Soulsborne games, and I guess it's time for me to go into that a little bit more. The combat in Bloodborne is no short of incredible. The main difference between combat in Bloodborne and combat in the rest of these Soulsborne games is that well, in Bloodborne, you don't really use shields because there's only a couple in the game and they're not very good. Instead, in your offhand, you're going to use guns. Guns in Bloodborne can be compared to shields in the Souls games, except the only difference is you can't block with them. You can only parry. When you shoot an enemy who is in mid-swing at the right time, you can stun them and open them up for a visceral attack. Parrying and visceral attacks are emphasized in Bloodborne over evading. As you don't roll when you dodge anymore, you simply just dodge. This encourages players to be a lot more offensive in Bloodborne than they were in Souls games, and it's further encouraged by the fact that overkilling enemies gets you some health back. To add on to the great combat, there are tons of unique and awesome weapons in this game, and weapons in Bloodborne also have mode switching, allowing you to turn your cane into a whip or your saw into a cleaver at the click of a button. This really opens up movesets of weapons, and it feels great. Speaking of combat, the boss battles feel just as epic as in the Souls games. The caveat is that the three best bosses in the game are locked to the old hunter. DLC. The definitive versions of Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2 both include all the DLC so you don't have to worry about it, but be sure you grab the separate DLC if you decide you like Bloodborne because it's worth it. The three bosses I'm referring to are Lady Maria, Ludwig, and the Orphan of Cause. Some would say the Orphan of Cause is the hardest boss in the entire franchise, but I would have to disagree. I thought the repeat bosses and the Defiled Chalice were a lot harder. And of course, as I mentioned earlier in the video, no other bosses for me hold a candle to Manus in Dark Souls 1. Speaking of repeat bosses, this is another downfall of Bloodborne, especially if you choose to do the Chalice Dungeons. 
There are just a lot of repeat bosses in Bloodborne, just like there were in Dark Souls 2. Okay, seriously though, that was my last complaint about Bloodborne, and everything from here until my final review score will now be positive. While the high resolution textures and meshes are marred by the platform the game is locked to, the same can't be said for the sound design and the soundtrack, which are absolutely incredible. The boss battles are made five times more intense with the music you get in the background, and the environments you traverse fill you with even more dread as you hear the groans and moans of the city's former citizens turning into beasts. Speaking of the environments you traverse, they look rather samey compared to each other, but compared to the other games in the Soulsborne series, they look very different, and also they're more detailed, perhaps even more detailed than the newer game in the series, Dark Souls 3. The return of a hub world in the form of the Hunter's Dream brings Bloodborne a little closer to Demon Souls than Dark Souls, as the game does feel a bit more linear. But unlike in Demon Souls, the different paths you take do interconnect with each other. And they have checkpoints, which in Bloodborne are called lamps, but they're not just at the beginning of levels, and they also have shortcuts. Overall, I really enjoyed traversing the maps in Bloodborne. Alright, so with that, I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover about Bloodborne, and it's time for me to give my verdict, which I think a lot of diehard fans are really not going to like. But please restrain yourselves from downvoting just because we have a differing opinion. Instead, try and see where I'm coming from with this, even if you don't agree. I'm giving Bloodborne in its current state a 6 out of 10. Yes, indeed, this means this is my least favorite Soulsborne game. If it were to receive a PS5 update that fixes the frame rate issues, the anti aliasing, and the blur, then it would easily move above Dark Souls 2 for me. Furthermore, if it got a PC port where you don't have to pay to play online with friends, and if the matchmaking actually worked, it would probably move above Demon's Souls for me. And keep in mind, that's without changing gameplay at all. So yeah, overall, Bloodborne is a fine game that is marred by the hardware it is locked to. Dark Souls 3 came out in 2016, only a year after the release of Bloodborne. This marked year 3 of From Software just hammering out Soulsborne games back to back. You might think this would have caused them to decrease in quality due to all the developers maybe getting tired of the franchise by this point, but after playing Dark Souls 3, I'm glad they didn't stop with Bloodborne. Dark Souls 3 begins with this opening cutscene you see here. It explains that in the Kingdom of Lothric, a bell has rung, and it signals the dying of the first flame. This means the Age of Fire is nearing its end. It also explains how the bell tolling awakened the Lords of Cinder who have abandoned their thrones. The Age of Fire nearing its end causes the undead to rise, including you, the Ashen One. The game begins with you rising up out of the Cemetery of Ash. Eventually, the Ashen One finds their way to Firelink Shrine. If you played the first game, the first thing you'll notice is that this is a very different Firelink Shrine. Instead of it being a crossroads like in the first game, it is more of a hub world like the Nexus in Demon's Souls or the Hunter's Dream in Bloodborne. Here you'll meet several NPCs including the Firekeeper, which is your means of leveling up. She tells you you need to find the Lords of Cinder and return them to their thrones that are here at Firelink. With that information, you, the Ashen One, set off on your adventure. And oh, what an adventure it is. In Dark Souls 3, you'll be traveling through many varied landscapes, just like in the other Souls games. And Dark Souls 3 is a beautiful looking game on PC. It doesn't support high frame rates like most PC games do these days, but that's fine by me because it at least has 60 FPS and that's a lot better than 30 FPS. And luckily Dark Souls 3 doesn't suffer from any of the same graphical issues that Bloodborne does. All around, Dark Souls 3 was just a pleasure to look at. So other than the graphics in terms of the actual areas themselves in the map design, well, it's a lot better than Dark Souls 2 to say the least, and it doesn't have any like terrible areas like the frigid outskirts. It also has some returning areas from Dark Souls 1, but they're not just copy and paste jobs, and I actually enjoyed the throwbacks quite a bit. And of course, there are some stunning new areas to traverse as well. The only thing that put me off in terms of the map design is the fact that the hub world acts like a hub world here instead of a crossroads like it did in Dark Souls 1 and 2. The paths are still interconnected here like they are in Bloodborne and not like in Demon's Souls, which is good, but I feel like the sense of scale and the exploration would have been helped if this game worked on a crossroads system like in Dark Souls 1. 
I can't help but imagine what Dark Souls 3 would have been like had this been the case. Similarly to Dark Souls 2, you can also teleport between bonfires right off the bat, which is indeed convenient, but it does kind of hurt the overall exploration aspect. And while we're comparing it to other Souls games, they did indeed bring back the feature where you lose your max HP upon death, but it is a flat 30% instead of a flat 50% like in Demon Souls, or a continuous 10% like in Dark Souls 2. But it's less annoying here than it ever has been for a couple of reasons. One, the item that revives you, which is now called an ember in this game, heals you to max HP again. Two, you find these embers very frequently. And three, while there aren't life gems in Dark Souls 3, it seems like you get more Estus than you ever have before. It's for this reason, actually, that some of my friends say that Dark Souls 3 is the easiest game in the franchise. I wouldn't really say that about the bosses because some of them are pretty tough, but yeah, it is true, you do have a lot of healing in this game. Speaking of the bosses, Dark Souls 3 has some of the most incredible boss fights in the series, and it really helps that the game is polished to a T. Movement feels smooth and combat feels fast and these two things come together to make some unforgettable boss battles. They definitely put a lot more effort into this than they did in Dark Souls 2. When it comes to the bosses themselves, there aren't really any terrible ones and also it seems they learned their lesson from Dark Souls 2 and Bloodborne and there's only really one repeat boss in the entire game. Some of the memorable boss fights for me included Slave Knight Gale, Dark Eater Madeer, the Demon Prince, Sister Freed, and the Nameless King. I would say they were slightly less memorable than the bosses in Dark Souls 1 for me, but that might just be because I had already played so many Soulsborne games before I played this one. In terms of boss difficulty, I can see how Sister Freed, Dark Eater Madeer, or the Nameless King might end up on some of the hardest bosses lists that you see around YouTube. But in my opinion, they don't stack up against the Defiled Chalice bosses in Bloodborne, the Orphan of Cause, or of course, Manus and Dark Souls 1. But just because I think they're easier doesn't mean I don't think that they're fun. They are a lot of fun. And that's largely due to the polish I was mentioning earlier, and also their movesets seem vastly expanded from the bosses in Dark Souls 1. Just like in the other games, there was a lot of effort put into the soundtrack here. I wouldn't call it my favorite soundtrack in the series, but it is probably the most consistent. Each track makes the boss fights feel epic. I was hoping for some more innovation here because it really is the same as the other Dark Souls games. You're setting out on this adventure to kill a handful of bosses and that's the story. But I mean, I know these games aren't really story focused. It's more about the gameplay and well, the lore if you want to dig into that. So yeah, I'm not going to take off too much for this, but I was kind of hoping for something a little bit different from the last game in the Soul series. Other than that, I'll throw in one nitpick about the game here. Just that, you know, the durability mechanic is here, but it's absolutely useless. My weapons never broke the entire game. I don't really know why they included the durability mechanic if you never have to worry about it the entire playthrough. So yeah, Dark Souls 3. Not really much else to say about this game. It's an excellent game, and I think you should play it, but I would stop just short of calling it a must-play game. The exploration and scale of the world didn't quite feel as good as it did in Dark Souls 1, and the game was overall less memorable for me. This could have been due to the fact that the story was largely the same as the other Dark Souls games, or, again, that could just be due to the fact that it's the last one I played and I might have been burnt out by the time I played it, but that's just my thoughts on it. I'm gonna give Dark Souls 3 a 9.5 out of 10, just short of a must-play rating. Dark Souls 3 is an excellent game and you should play it if you have time. The next game we need to talk about is Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Sekiro came out in 2019, a full three years after Dark Souls 3 came out. And with Sekiro, From Software decided to change up the formula even more than they did with Bloodborne. Sekiro feels like it's in a completely different genre than the other Soulsborne games, and we're really only talking about it here because it captures the essence of a Soulsborne game and because it's made by From Software. When you start a new game, you'll get this cutscene that sets the background for the story. It explains that Sekiro takes place in Japan near the end of the Sengoku period. 
However, Sekiro is far from historically accurate. Sekiro is an alternate history story where myths come to life. Although Sekiro does lean a little bit less into fantasy than the other games in the Soulsborne franchise. Most enemies in Sekiro are humanoid, however, many of the creatures that you'll come across are just greatly exaggerated versions of their real life counterparts rather than completely made up entities. Magic does exist in Sekiro, but it's to a much more limited degree. Some enemies do have it, and you as the player also have it in the form of ninjutsu, but this is very limited in scope as you only have three spells you can use. True to the opening cinematic, Sekiro is very much a sword fighting game. And the Sengoku period is a great background for such a game. The cinematic shows a member of the Ashina clan, Genichiro, besting General Tamura. Genichiro is part of a coup led by Master Ishin. This implies there was some sort of civil war between different factions within the Ashina clan. The cinematic then cuts to a young swordsman all alone on the battlefield. This is you, Sekiro. A stranger approaches and takes a liking to you. He takes you under his wing, trains you as a shinobi, and he even becomes your adoptive father. Once you become a master shinobi, he assigns you a master, the young boy known as Kuro. You are to protect Kuro at all costs and bring him back if he's taken. Other than the word of your adoptive father, Kuro's word is to be absolute. As you can probably tell, Sekiro has the most upfront storytelling of any Soulsborne game yet, and we're not even done, this is just the opening cinematic. I'm undecided on which type of storytelling I enjoy more from From Software. The game begins with you, Sekiro, also known as Wolf, wasting away at the bottom of a well after having lost everything. This is when the woman known as Emma drops a note down to you implying that your master might be in trouble. As a loyal shinobi, off you go to save Master Kuro. On your way there, you eavesdrop on some guards and discover that Lord Genichiro, who is now leader of the Ashina clan, has imprisoned Kuro for unknown reasons. So naturally, you sneak and parkour your way to the back entrance of the house where Kuro is being held. Here, Master Kuro gives you a sword, Kusabi Maru, as you two devise an escape plan. You make all the way to the outskirts of Ashina when you're met by Genichiro himself. He shames you for attempting desertion and you get into a fight where he cuts off your arm and you black out in a field. You awaken in a temple and discover that a Buddhist sculptor has nursed you back to health. Using his sculpting skills, he also managed to create you a prosthetic. The sculptor tells you that they're holding Kuro in Ashina Castle. The one that dropped the note down to you earlier in the well is also here, Emma. She explains that she's a doctor serving a certain master, but she won't tell you who that is. This temple, the dilapidated temple, is the closest thing that you get to a hub world in Sekiro. Like Dark Souls 1's Firelink Shrine, this temple is actually connected to the rest of the world. It doesn't exist in its own pocket dimension. That being said, it doesn't feel quite as connected as there's less paths leading back to it. The only things you'll ever need to do here are talk to people to progress the story, come back here to level up your healing gourd, which is the Estus equivalent in Sekiro, and to come back here to change your prosthetic arm. Luckily, you can interact with your skill tree or upgrade your attack power and vitality from any sculptor's idol in the world. The sculptor's idols in Sekiro are pretty much the same as the bonfires from Dark Souls. The first time you die, you'll discover the reason why Genichiro is so interested in Kuro. Genichiro wants the same gift that Kuro has given you, the gift of the dragon's heritage, which is essentially immortality. When you die in Sekiro, you're often given the option to resurrect right on the spot, which is really nice, but don't be thinking the game is any easier because of it. In fact, gameplay-wise, Sekiro is probably the hardest Soulsborne game. This is thanks to the fastest combat in the franchise and the removal of most RPG mechanics, meaning you are locked into the specific way they want you to play. In Sekiro, there aren't different classes to choose from. You are a shinobi. That's what you are. The game is laser focused on this point. The RPG mechanics that do exist include a skill tree and upgrades for your prosthetic arm. These two things put together can allow some variation in your play style, but you're still always going to be a shinobi. These design decisions allowed From Software to develop an action adventure Soulsborne game with lightning fast combat rather than an RPG Soulsborne game where you have lots of freedom of play style. This linearity is something that a lot of people will love, but I wasn't one of them. I much prefer freeform RPGs. At this point, you might be wondering why Sekiro is even considered a Soulsborne game. Well, that's because you do lose quite a bit of stuff on death. So you need experience points that turn into skill points to level up your skill tree. 
And additionally, Sekiro has a currency called Sin that you can use to buy items from merchants and upgrade your prosthetic and stuff like that. When you die in Sekiro and you don't have an on-the-spot resurrection, you have a chance that you'll lose your earned experience points and sin. Unlike Souls and Souls games, or even Blood Echoes and Bloodborne, there's no way to recover your lost experience and sin. When you die in Sekiro, you only get one on-the-spot resurrection, at which point you have to death blow an enemy to be able to get that resurrection back. Resurrection is far from the only combat difference between Sekiro and the other Soulsborne games. In Sekiro, there's a meter visible for you called the Posture Meter. The posture for whoever you're locked onto is shown at the top of your screen, and the posture for your character is shown at the bottom of your screen. Posture could be compared to the Invisible Poise Meter in the other Soulsborne games, except Posture is a lot more important in Sekiro than Poise ever was. In Sekiro, if you break an enemy's posture, you can deal a death blow to them. This will make them die instantly, or if they're a boss with multiple phases, it will move them to their next phase. This is very important in Sekiro because bosses have a lot of health and they're very good at deflecting your attacks. So a lot of the times, the easiest way to kill them is to just destroy their posture bar. This is why many people say Sekiro actually has two health bars. The enemy can also break your posture, allowing them to get in for some massive damage. The best way to deplete your enemy's posture is to keep attacking and deflect their attacks at the right time. Deflection could be compared to parrying in the Souls games, although it's a lot more forgiving as you can spam the deflection button repeatedly. A poorly timed deflection will prevent health damage being dealt to you, but you'll still take posture damage for it, and a perfectly timed deflection will deal posture damage to the enemy. Due to this posture system and the fact that Sekiro got rid of stamina from the other Soulsborne games makes Sekiro a game of constant aggression. A recurring theme in Sekiro is hesitation is defeat. Sek Sekiro also has a few changes elsewhere that indirectly affect the combat, like for example the fact that there is a grappling hook system. This makes navigating the world super exciting and while the levels are still linear, they feel less corridor-like due to the verticality. The grappling hook ties into combat because sometimes during combat the game will let you grapple onto your enemy with the grappling hook. The time frame in which you can do this is often small, but it's super rewarding when you're able to pull it off and get that extra attack in. Sekiro is also the first game in the Soulsborne franchise that has actual stealth. Sometimes you can sneak through an entire area without fighting anyone, or you're able to start boss fights with the boss on its second phase because the game actually allows you to sneak up on them sometimes to get a death blow. Another exciting part about the Sekiro combat are the perilous attacks. During these attacks, a red kanji for the word danger is shown on the screen. That's because these attacks do massive damage and there's different ways of dealing with them depending on which type of perilous attack it is. For a sweep attack, you're going to need to jump over it. Jumping is a much bigger part of Sekiro than any of the other Soulsborne games. For a thrust attack, contrary to instinct, you're actually going to want to dodge into the attack if you have the skill Makiri counter. If successful, you will stomp down on their weapon and deal significant posture damage. Just like the other Soulsborne games, there are also grab attacks, and there's not really a good counter for these, you're just going to want to get out of the way. The last thing to talk about when it comes to combat is actually something I didn't like that much. Sekiro introduces a new concept to the Soulsborne franchise in the form of combat arts, which allows you to apply a combat skill to your weapon. This is a cool mechanic that got revised and stuck around in the next game in the Soulsborne franchise, Elden Ring. But in Sekiro, I didn't like it for one reason and one reason only. You trigger combat arts by pressing both the left and the right bumper at the same time. Now, the left bumper by default is your deflection key, and your right bumper by default is your attack key. So as you can imagine, a lot of times when you're in heated combat, you'll end up using one of these combat arts on accident when you didn't mean to. When I used combat arts, I used the Ichimanji because of its massive posture damage. But near the end of the game, I found myself dying all the time because of accidentally Ichimanjiing when I shouldn't have been, due to me accidentally pressing the left and right bumper around the same time in the heat of battle. I noticed this most during the Demon of Hatred fight, so I took the Ichimanji off and just left the combat arts slot empty and I instantly started doing better at the game. And that's a good segue for me to start talking about the bosses. I do think the bosses on average in Sekiro are harder than in any other Soulsborne game. Their timing is tight, many of them can deflect your attacks, 
many of them have multiple phases, and you're not going to kill most of these bosses based on their regular health bar, you pretty much have to destroy their posture most times. And on top of all of that, unlike the other games, you don't have RPG mechanics to fall back on if you're having a tough time. You can't just go grind out levels or use some cheesy strat to brute force your way through a boss in Sekiro. But just because a boss is hard doesn't mean a boss is good, so let me reassure you, the bosses in Sekiro are fantastic on average. Don't get me wrong, Sekiro does have its fair share of gimmick and repeat bosses, but I would say it's less of a problem here than in the other Soulsborne games where this was an issue. I actually found many of the gimmick bosses to be fun, aside from the folding screen monkeys, unfortunately. Any gimmick or repeat bosses are made up for by the fact that the other bosses in the game are fantastic. I mean, to name a few, this game has Genichiro, Lady Butterfly, Ishin, the Guardian Ape, and of course, the Demon of Hatred. The Demon of Hatred gives Manus a run for his money. I mean, I was spamming the attack button so much during this fight that it broke my Xbox Elite Series 2 controller that was brand new. I had to send it in for repairs because of the Demon of Hatred. Speaking of the Demon of Hatred, this is a boss you'll never find if you don't explore. Due to the lack of RPG elements, there's a lack of gear to find for exploration, but Sekiro does reward you for exploring in the form of secret bosses and areas. This was unexpected as Sekiro is more of an action-adventure game than an RPG, and typically those types of games don't do that. So I was rewarded for exploring, even if exploration wasn't quite as fun as it was in the other RPG Soulsborne games. It's almost time to wrap it up, but let's talk about the graphics and sound for a second before I give this game a score. Sekiro isn't really a slouch in the graphics department, and there were a few instances where it blew me away, but those were definitely few and far between. I guess I was spoiled due to seeing a different, better looking samurai game, Ghost of Tsushima. The sound design on the other hand is superb, and as you're deflecting attacks and clashing steel on steel, it makes it feel like you're playing a samurai movie. The soundtrack is also amazing. There are these epic compositions with these Japanese woodwind instruments taking front and center. Because of the major stylistic difference, I don't know that this soundtrack could even be compared to any of the other Soulsborne games. I think we've covered all our bases, so let's get into the rating. In conclusion, Sekiro is an amazing game that separates itself from its counterparts due to its unique storytelling and gameplay. This shift away from Sekiro being an RPG to being a more linear action-adventure game is not going to be for all fans of other Soulsborne games, myself included. That being said, I still enjoyed the game to an extent, and because I'm not a fan of those types of games in general, that on its own is an achievement. I can easily see fans of the action-adventure genre giving this game a 9.5 or even a 10. For me though, I'm going to have to give Sekiro Shadows Die Twice a 9 out of 10. I really only docked points on Sekiro because of personal preference and the fact that you can't rebind the key to trigger your combat art. Sekiro is an excellent game that's bound to bring in fans of other genres to the Soulsborne franchise, even if it might leave longtime RPG fans a little divided. Elden Ring came out on February 25th, 2022, and because Sekiro didn't end up getting DLC, its release ended the longest ever drought of new official Soulsborne content. Since Sekiro wasn't really for all Souls fans, some fans were left waiting even longer. I believe this drought helped Elden Ring achieve its immense success through the extra development time it provided and the built-up anticipation from fans. Additionally, in the time between Dark Souls 3 and Elden Ring, Soulsborne content creators really started gaining traction. A lot of these creators had been around since Dark Souls 2, but they found new success during this period. For example, one of the most popular Soulsborne creators, Vati Vidya, created lore videos on Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3 in 2015 and 2016 respectively. By 2017, these videos had over 2 million views each, and today they sit at a whopping 12 million views each. It's these factors together, combined with the fact that Elden Ring is an amazing game, that made it shoot all the way up to the top of Steam charts shortly after release. It's one of the few single-player games that managed to, for a short time, dethrone the multiplayer giants like Counter-Strike, Dota 2, and more. To this day, Elden Ring holds the top record for most people playing a single-player game at one time on Steam. It is only followed by Baldur's Gate 3 and Cyberpunk 2077.
To call Elden Ring a success would be an understatement. It dominated the industry, and it did so without really making the game any more accessible than the previous games, which is really interesting. In a sea of brain-dead easy AAA games, Elden Ring proved that the mainstream has a place for hard games. I think it was the first game to prove this since, well, games that are now considered retro. Elden Ring starts with a cinematic providing lore. Similar to Demon's Souls, Elden Ring takes place in a land beyond the fog called the Lands Between. In these lands, the great Elden Ring has been shattered. God Queen Marika has gone missing and her son Godwin has been assassinated. Marika's other offspring, who are demigods, now hold the shards of the Elden Ring. Driven mad by their newfound power, they fought each other in a war known as the Shattering. This war had no victors and led to the Lands Between being abandoned by the Greater Will, which is the outside force that sent the Elden Ring to the Lands Between in the first place. With that, the Erd Tree calls upon and revives the Tarnished, who are individuals that had previously been banished from the Lands Between by Queen Marika. The Tarnished include you, the player character, and several other powerful beings that you'll come to meet in your journey. The Erd Tree tells you to restore the Elden Ring and become Elden Lord. Just like in the Souls games, you know from the beginning you have to go around and destroy these powerful bosses, but it's told very differently. There's a lot of politics going on here, and there's actually so much going on you would think that some of this stuff wouldn't be explored in actual playtime, but most of it is. After doing everything you can in Elden Ring, I did have a few questions left unanswered, but there is a DLC coming up, so we'll see. Elden Ring is a bit more straightforward in its approach to storytelling compared to the older Souls games or Bloodborne. It isn't quite as straightforward as Sekiro in its storytelling, but it is a good balance between Sekiro and Dark Souls, and I like that. I think they should stick to this in the future. The writer of Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin, did the world building for Elden Ring. Often world building includes the backstory, so if he gave them this part here at the beginning, that is just gold. He set the story up for success. And Miyazaki and his team definitely saw it through to completion. There are six endings to this game and they're vastly different from one another. You won't even know some of these are an option unless you explore the whole game like I did. And some stuff is so hidden that I only found out about it through talking to a friend that was using a guide. Yes, illusory walls make a return, but beyond that, there's stuff that is even harder to find than it ever was in Dark Souls. When you arrive in the lands between, you die, but surprise, all is not as it seems. You wake up in a shallow pool of water to a cloaked woman and her steed torrent. You pass out again and they're gone, but she's left you a flask of crimson tears, which is Elden Ring's Estus flask equivalent, and a flask of cerulean tears for magic. After going through some tutorial stuff and finding your first sight of Lost Grace, you end up in the open world and meet Vade, who, after roasting you, tells you to follow the light put off by these sites of lost grace. He also suggests that the reason you can't die has something to do with this Erd tree. The Erd tree is, well, it's a giant glowing mysterious tree, you can't miss it. If you're not like me and you actually follow the light of the lost grace instead of running around maidenless for two hours the wrong direction, then you'll eventually come across a site of lost grace where the cloaked woman from earlier shows up and introduces herself as Melina. She's a finger maiden serving the two fingers and she offers guidance. She offers to be your maiden if you take her to the foot of the Erd Tree. Once you say yes, you can summon her from any side of Lost Grace to level you up. She also gives you her Spectral Steed Whistle, allowing you to summon Torrent, her Spectral Steed, whenever you feel like it. Unlike previous games in the franchise, Elden Ring is a real open world game. This makes having a horse for travel pretty essential, and he's a horse with some special tricks. Not only can you jump while riding Torrent, but you can also participate in mounted combat. It's actually so good that some bosses, like specific dragons, feel like they were designed to be fought while on horseback. This is something I unfortunately didn't think about until like halfway through the game because I was just used to the older games at this point. I made many dragon fights way too hard on myself. The last neat trick that Torrent has are called Spirit Springs. These are wells of energy that shoot up into the air. If you jump while inside one, you will go flying as high as the Spirit Spring allows you to. No worries though, if you land where you're supposed to, you won't take fall damage. 
This travel innovation and the fact that the game places heavy emphasis on exploration lead me to believe that this game was heavily influenced by the success of another game, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, that came out five years earlier and repopularized the non-Ubisoft style of open world game. What I mean by that is like Breath of the Wild, there aren't little interest markers all over the map telling you exactly where to go to do things. No, you have to find this stuff on your own. As you explore Elden Ring's world, the map fills in for you, and sometimes this can actually help you find interesting things, as you might have filled in a map spot, and you can see just on the edge there might be something there, so you go check it out. And even though you have a world map, you want to keep mental notes of things that you find, because there is a lot of backtracking in this game. That might be weird to say for an open world game, but most of the content in this game is relevant to the greater story. But that's not the case with all the content in this game, and that's what brings me to my first of two complaints with Elden Ring. There are a lot of dungeons in Elden Ring that are there to try and fill in the open world with content. And unfortunately, a lot of these dungeons are low effort. While playing through them, I was often being reminded of the Chalice dungeons in Bloodborne, unfortunately. Luckily, I did have a better time with them than the Chalice dungeons. They feel a little bit more handcrafted, and there are definitely some secrets to be found in these dungeons. But they all kind of look the same, and most of them end with repeat bosses. Yes, unfortunately Elden Ring has a ton of repeat bosses, including some bosses that are just incredibly annoying and unfun to fight, like the Tree Spirits. But ultimately, I think I can look past this transgression with Elden Ring because it is a real open world game. But in the future, if we get an Elden Ring 2, I'd like to see them put more effort into these dungeons, make them look a little bit different from one another, and put more unique bosses at the end. Speaking of bosses, Elden Ring has its fair share of incredibly memorable boss battles including Margit, Godric, Radon, Malaketh, Melania, Moog, Astel, and of course Dragonlord Placidusax. And luckily while there were a bunch of duplicate bosses, there weren't any truly terrible bosses that I could think of. I had mentioned before that you can fight some bosses on horseback, but this isn't the only area where Elden Ring significantly changes up the gameplay from Dark Souls 3. For starters, jumping is a little bit more of a mechanic in Elden Ring. There are actually some boss attacks that you can jump over. They took a little bit of influence from Sekiro in this regard. But don't get me wrong, it's not as important here as it was in Sekiro. They also took the combat arts from Sekiro and turned them into Ashes of War. And instead of unlocking them through a skill tree, you actually find these items in the world. Luckily in Elden Ring, there's no reason not to use them because they have their own dedicated button. Ashes of War can apply to multiple different types of weapons too, so it creates more variety of the type of build you can play if you want to use a specific combat art. Elden Ring is the first time I've played a build based around magic in the form of incantations. Most of these basically just buffed me, but a few of them dealt massive damage. I was more open to using magic in Elden Ring because it just looked less janky and it felt like a lot of the game was built around it. Also, it seemed more balanced than the other games. Um, some of the spells in some of the earlier Souls games looked completely broken. Also, I had just played like six games in a row completely melee. If you still have a problem with me using magic thinking it's broken, you might want to remember that bleed builds exist. <laughs> but speaking of broken, spirit ashes. In previous Soulsborne games other than Sekiro, you can summon NPCs to fight for you at specific locations, and you can even summon players to fight for you. Um, but in Elden Ring, you can not only do that, you also have items called Spirit Ashes that allow you to summon ghostly NPCs to come fight for you. It's really fun, and for a portion of the game it felt like cheating, but near the end of the game, these things just get demolished and they become completely useless. I did use them, and it was the only game I really used summons in. Between all the new mechanics and vast variety of weapons, Elden Ring felt like it had a lot more freedom when it comes to your build. It definitely satisfied the RPG itch I needed after playing Sekiro. And it also freshened up the Souls formula after the lack of innovation in Dark Souls 3. Now after you gain a maiden, you're tasked with infiltrating Stormvale Castle. This brings us to our first level that feels like, well, just a regular Souls level. And it's a really good one too. Without these regular Souls levels put into the Elden Ring open world, then I don't think the open world would have been worth it. But thanks to these levels, everything comes together. 
Stormvale is also where I encountered my first bug. Now, I've heard this has been fixed in later patches, but this was a pretty bad bug for me. Elden Ring does have a hub world in the form of the Round Table Hold, like Demon's Souls that exists in its own pocket dimension. Now, you don't go there immediately. Melina is supposed to take you there upon arriving in Stormvale Castle so you can upgrade your weapons and stuff, which is where you do that at. But in my game, she would not take me there until after I beat Margit. Needless to say, the Margit fight for me was pretty tough. Because Elden Ring is an open world that is very big, I can't really complain about it not having a standard Dark Souls 1 or 2 type crossroads system. The pocket dimension is completely fine here, I don't see it working any other way. Stormvale is a good opportunity for me to talk about level design and the level design of Stormvale is actually incredible. It might top anything in the regular Souls games, I was just blown away by it. I love Stormvale Castle. There's actually even platforming going on in Stormvale because of the jumping. And all these standard Souls levels within Elden Ring all felt different from one another. And also the open world areas in Elden Ring felt very different from each other as well. There are zero issues there and a lot of the areas harken back to older Souls games but there's some even newer designs and stuff that I have not seen in any other Souls game. Elden Ring just looks incredible in general between all the whimsical particle effects and the foliage that's everywhere. I'm actually kind of surprised how well they adapted their engine to be an open world. It works great. And for me there were only really frame drops at the very beginning of the game when you first step out into Limgrave. After that I didn't have performance issues whatsoever. A lot of the assets look just as good or even better than they did in Dark Souls 3. And because of grafting some of the boss designs are even more disturbing. The sound design complements all this perfectly, and the soundtrack is so good I might even call it a classic at this point. PvP in Elden Ring is also really good, especially after the update where they added different stats when you're in PvP versus when you're playing solo. The only problem I have with Elden Ring PvP though is the lack of invasions. In Dark Souls games, when you're revived, you have the chance to be invaded, and this is really cool. In Elden Ring it works a little bit differently. When you're summoning other players for co-op is when you get a chance to be invaded. So I don't know if they did this to incentivize playing co-op or if they did this to appease players who wanted to be solitary. Regardless of why, I didn't really want to play co-op because co-op has never really been a seamless experience in the Souls games. So this resulted in my playthrough of Elden Ring being largely solitary. I feel like it would have been made slightly better if I always had that constant risk of being invaded in the back of my head like it was in the Dark Souls games. If they made this change to appease solo players, well they shouldn't have because if you want to be solo you can always go offline. In conclusion, Elden Ring is just as memorable as Dark Souls 1 to me. It has a few issues like lack of invasions, the various repeat boss fights, and the low effort dungeons. Because of these issues, I feel like I would put it below Dark Souls 1, but luckily Elden Ring's story, gameplay, and innovation in the genre is enough to give it a must play from me. And remember what I said about must play games on my scale, that means Elden Ring is a 10 out of 10. It's so good I suggest that if if you haven't played it yet, you do so now. At last we've made it to the end of the video, thank you for sticking around this far. On screen I put a little recap of what I rated all the games. These scores averaged out equals around 8.5, so that is what I'm going to give the Soulsborne franchise out of 10. I've also prepared a list of what games I thought had the hardest bosses on average as well as the hardest areas on average. If you agree or disagree with this video, make sure to leave a comment down below. It really helps engagement and I'd like to hear what you think. Also make sure to like and subscribe because these videos take a long time to make. I would really appreciate it. And with that, I hope you enjoyed the video, so until next time, peace.